Imagine a world where every penny you save or spend makes a difference. We are all investors in our own ways. Whether you are saving for retirement, investing through our mandatory provident fund, buying stocks, or just putting money in the bank, your choices matter. But have you ever thought about how your money could help build a better future? Companies are big players in this game, too. They put their money into all sorts of projects and businesses. But here's the big question. Are we all thinking about the future when we make these choices? As we work towards a world that's good for us and good for the planet, it's time to think about where our money goes. Welcome back to another episode of Sustainability in Action. I'm Ross Vermeer. Today, we're exploring how our investments can help shape a better, greener future. Are we investing in ways that benefit both the environment and our communities? And it's not just us. Businesses are also considering more than just financial returns. They're looking at sustainability, too. In this episode, we're diving into the world of green and sustainable finance. Our first expert guest, Mohan Dawani, will provide us with a detailed explanation of this concept. We'll then explore the significance of considering environmental, social, and governance, or ESG, factors when making investment decisions. Actually, um, green finance and sustainable finance is a term that's commonly intermixed. But if you actually look at a little bit of a history, what happened is that back in 2015, there was a major summit and there was a Paris climate agreement that was reached. And also around the same time, there was sustainable development goals issued by the United Nations. So really, you know, we're really talking about two different things. One is sustainability. The other is really um, what we call green. Okay, sustainability is sort of country to country, long term goals. For example, you know, we're doing some research on retirement age, etc. So gainful employment for everybody is a sustainability goal. Now, whereas when you look at green, you're looking at things like climate. And really, a lot of people forget it all started with wanting to have the carbon emission lowered so that the temperature rise does not exceed two degrees compared with the pre-industrial time. We're now actually looking at more aggressive goal of 1.5. So when you look at green finance, it, it really is about that financing in which sort of the carbon footprint is reduced so that you know we come to some good for the environment whereby we lower the temperature rise in the society as a whole. And we know the catastrophic effect from the IPCC of all the work that there is there in order to ensure that you know, we need to come to some sort of consensus of the environment being really important uh, and really you know, uh, the devastating effect of climate change. Now, in terms of uh, sustainability finance, we are really looking at what would happen if we gave financing to sort of whole economies and also players within there, uh, such that sustainable goals are actually achieved. Uh, initially, under the UN, but also in parallel, what happened is there was this in society, this issue of sustainability that is not looking at short term profit, but looking at long term profit in terms of not just profiting company, but the whole environment, the society and everybody as a whole. So in a way, there is an overlap. It seems very complicated, an answer to a very simple question. But actually, there is a very fine distinction between green finance, which really looks at climate change and financing to reduce climate change. It could be bonds, it could be all sorts of other equity issue, vis-a-vis -vis resilience finance for sustainability so that the whole economy and also the individual companies actually look at a longer term. So I think that would be a fair takeaway on the differences between the two. But again, in the marketplace, uh, there is a mix and match and people really understand the ultimate objective is to do something good, uh, something not for this generation, but actually in the future generation as well. Green and sustainable finance are financial activities that help us transition to a low carbon, sustainable economy. They address global challenges like climate change and new environmental risks. 
Green Finance focuses on funding projects that positively impact the environment, like reducing greenhouse gas emissions and promoting renewable energy. Sustainable Finance is all about integrating environmental, social and governance, or ESG, factors into financial decision-making. The goal is to direct capital towards projects that support sustainable development. The E in ESG stands for Environment. This involves how businesses innovate to reduce their environmental impact. This could be through reducing carbon emissions and deforestation, improving energy efficiency, tackling air and water pollution, addressing water scarcity, managing waste and preserving biodiversity. The S stands for social, which considers the people directly and indirectly involved in the business, as well as the community where the business operates. Key issues include employee and customer satisfaction, diversity, equity and inclusion, community relations, and respect for labor rights, consumer rights and human rights. Finally, the G stands for governance. This refers to a company's structure and control systems that ensure its operations align with its objectives and that its people comply with relevant standards and laws. In essence, sustainable finance is about making financial decisions with the environment, society and good governance in mind. Now, let's turn our attention to our esteemed guest speakers as they share their valuable insights on how their investment decisions have shifted towards green finance and sustainable investing. A lot of countries have planted carbon neutrality by 2050. But in order to achieve that, a lot of investments, uh, whether towards smart energy or renewable sources, or energy sources or smart transportation system need to be front loaded. A lot of uh, green infrastructure project, green buildings would need new capital. So the financing function of Hong Kong would be able to satisfy a lot of this kind of demand. So for example, you may heard about green bonds, but actually it's way beyond that. We also have blue bonds, which support or helping out the ocean. We have got transition financing, which is helping, you know, company or corporates to have projects that go through a low carbon transition. Or in addition, we also have got something called SSL, the sustainability linked uh, financing or, or loans. So which helps corporates to basically raise capital and improve its own ESG performance. So the variety of this kind of green and sustainable financing is massive. On the other hand, the provision of this capital would came from, you know, the sustainable investing and hence all the various pensions, investment, trusts and funds would be able to provide the capital for these kind of financing opportunities. Now, in fact, if we look at a lot of research globally, right, there are actually very clear academic evidence that good ESG companies would drive good corporate financial performance uh, has been shown in some of the meta studies in the past few years. In addition to that, if we're talking about empirical evidence, i.e. You know, actual experience, there are actually more and more evidence that especially investing in emerging markets, which include in Asia, our region, in good DSG company has been consistently outperforming the wider emerging markets in the last 10 years. In 2022 alone, we arranged 2.8 billion Hong Kong dollars of green financing and we look forward to continuing to use our green financing framework to support further environmental and social initiatives in the future. So I touched on our broader green financing framework, but we've also been doing some work within MTR to see how we can fund and allocate funding to appropriate environmental and social projects. So we've come up with a new ESG investment framework. And the purpose of this is really twofold. One, it's to try and ensure that every investment that we make takes account of the environmental and social consequences of that investment. But secondly, it's to ensure that if we have specific environmental or social projects or environmental or social enhancements to other projects, that we have a separate pot of funding available for these. And so we now have balanced scorecards for environmental and social projects 
so that we can assess whether or not they align with our KPIs and whether we're really getting bang for the buck in terms of the environmental or social impact of those investments. And that enables us to choose which investments we should be prioritising and how we should be spending that pot of money over the course of a particular year. Sustainable finance provides incentive for corporate like uh, Andibas to commit to certain sustainability targets or benchmarks, including environment and social targets. For example, the annual greenhouse gas emission reduction and overall labor practice. Andibas announced its first sustainable link loan back in June 2020 by converting our then existing facility amounting to 1 billion Hong Kong dollar into a sustainability linked loan. Since then, NBS has accumulated over 4.5 billion of sustainable finance. Sustainable finance benefits us financially by way of marginally reducing our financing cost. But more importantly, this action demonstrates our third commitment to improving our sustainability performance. According to NUN report, the food production must be doubled by 2050. Therefore, our investment trend is about food production and the technology. Therefore, we invest in different startups with the local food production. As an ESG investment point of view, being practical and scalable is a very challenging task for the startup. Some of the startups focus too much on the research and the patent rather than making a real business. But this startup is different. They focus in the premium food production, about the salad and the herbs Actually, they convert the modular and the uh, sustainability into the real business. Therefore, their business can be replicated to different places with different size. We can reduce the carbon emission, especially on the transportation, compared with the foreign countries transported to the Hong Kong, to the local. Settlement is that this factory, just like an oxygen tank, actually, the system itself is an AI climate system. It can absorb the CO2 and release the O2. Therefore, we believe that in the near future, we can also sell the carbon credit to the stock market. Sustainable investing generally refers to considering a broad set of material ES and G factors to different sectors and companies in um, the investment processes and decisions. To date, there's no single definition of what sustainable investing is, which could be a little bit confusing. And in general, there are different types of um, SI um, that we, we can refer to. From you know, the most traditional or, or basic sense, we can screen out negative ESG risk or so-called sin stocks to achieve a sustainable investment portfolio. But in doing so, um, of course, we can you know, steer away from investing or enabling negatively um, impactful um, activities or even companies, um, but we're not really generating real world sustainability outcomes. So increasingly, when investors talk about ESG investing or sustainable investing, they're managing ESG risk to a company's financial bottom line, um, or even prioritizing value and impact by looking into the revenue contribution of each and every company, um, to the people, uh, planet, and society. Financial returns and social and environmental impacts should not be seen as an either-or dilemma, as they can coexist and mutually reinforce each other. When businesses prioritize and optimize their environmental and social performances, they can achieve financial success as well. Some businesses even enact measures to minimize harm and fully integrate sustainability into their overall strategy. Traditionally, however, investors have primarily evaluated a business's performance based on its financial returns. This raises the question of how we can assess the performance of business sectors in terms of the positive social and environmental impacts they generate in exchange for their financial returns. Business sectors, especially listed companies, are often required to have regular environmental, social and governance, or ESG, reports, which play a crucial role in demonstrating the relationship between financial performance and social or environmental impact. 
By providing transparent and comprehensive information about a company's ESG practices, these reports enable stakeholders to assess how a company's commitment to sustainability contributes to its financial success. Transparency and accountability. ESG reports provide transparency and accountability to stakeholders, including investors, customers, employees, and the general public. These reports disclose information about a company's environmental impact, social practices, and governance policies, enabling stakeholders to make informed decisions and hold companies accountable for their actions. Risk management. ESG reports help companies identify and manage potential risks related to environmental and social issues. By assessing and disclosing their sustainability performance, companies can mitigate risks associated with climate change, resource scarcity, labor practices, supply chain management, and other ESG-related factors. Investor demand. Investors are increasingly considering ESG factors when making investment decisions. ESG reports allow investors to evaluate a company's sustainability performance and align their investments with their values and long-term financial goals. Companies that demonstrate strong ESG performance may attract more investment and enjoy better access to capital. Regulatory requirements. Regulatory bodies and stock exchanges in many countries have started mandating ESG reporting for listed companies. These requirements aim to promote sustainable business practices, enhance corporate governance, and address environmental and social challenges at a systemic level. Evaluating sustainability performance is a constantly evolving field, and there's no single approach that provides a complete assessment. To drive positive environmental and social outcomes, companies should consider multiple perspectives, engage stakeholders, and continuously improve their sustainability practices. Organizations offer ESG ratings and rankings that evaluate companies based on factors like carbon emissions, diversity, labor practices, and transparency. Frameworks such as GRI, SASB, and TCFD provide guidelines for companies to assess their sustainability performance. Additionally, industries have specific metrics to evaluate sustainability, such as energy generation for renewable energy companies and supply chain labor practices for apparel companies. These industry-specific metrics provide targeted assessments. To shed light on the sustainability performance of companies, the Stock Exchange of Hong Kong, or SEHK, introduced the Environmental, Social and Governance, or ESG, reporting guide back in 2013. As part of the listing rules and starting from 2016, SEHK has mandated that all listed companies produce an annual ESG report. These requirements for ESG disclosures have been periodically reviewed and updated over time. Now, let's hear from our guests as they share insights on how their team considers ESG factors and determines the investment directions for their clients. First, we are facing increasingly stringent climate disclosure requirements from regulators. For example, the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, TCFD, framework by 2025. Second, there has been ever-rising expectations from investors and ESG rating agencies. Third, and this point is specific to NDBS, our company has such diversified businesses spanning from tow roads, construction, insurance, logistics to facility management. It is therefore quite challenging to make sure all of the businesses rise above and beyond the disclosure requirements. Our responses to those challenges include, we have clear strategic guidance, oversight, and governance directly from CEO and the senior management. Also, we proactively set out climate resilient strategies holistically at a group and various business units levels. We take a bottom-up approach to make sure ESG research is completely embedded as part of our fundamental research in evaluating our investee company's ESG performance. Um, in terms of measurement, we do reference third-party ESG ratings and external data sets to um, inform our analysis. 
but Fidelity has developed its proprietary ESG ratings in 2019, and um, the same set of ratings were updated in 2021 to embed what we call double materiality. Um, double materiality essentially looks at the ESG risks that impact a company's bottom line, but also um, a company's contribution, uh, whether it's negative or positive, to um, the society and the environment. The set of ESG ratings take a, a more forward-looking approach as compared to third-party ESG ratings. Third-party ESG ratings typically base their judgments on um, disclosures of a company, which means they're looking at information um, that you know uh, describe the performance from over a year ago. Um, for us, as a long-term investor, we want to make sure um, the ratings can be combined with our engagement to give us a more forward-looking view to understand the trajectory of a company um, to see whether you know ESG is improving, stable, or deteriorating, and that would enable us to make better investment portfolio decisions. We also need to capture the positive contribution of um, individual companies to the sustainable development goals by the UN, for example. So for that, we have developed an SDG tool to um, estimate the revenue contribution of companies' products and services to specific investable um, targets and indicators under the 17 SDGs, um, and to better understand individual companies' alignment with the 1.5 degree decarbonization pathway, we have also designed a climate rating, um, which is part of our overall engine with you know internal and also external climate data to help us um, understand um, where a company sits in terms of uh, moving towards this net zero transition. ESG ratings and disclosure frameworks provide valuable guidance to companies as they structure, prepare, and share their ESG information. It's important to note, however, that currently different companies use different rating systems. To shed light on this issue, let's hear from Mohan Dawani as he shares his views. I mean, we were talking about um, resilience financing or sustainability financing or green financing. Now, it's very, very hard to actually gauge whether something is actually green or something is very good for sustainability. So that's why there were some companies that came up. And these companies, remember, are private companies. There's actually no international standards. So for reality, there is a weakness right now because there's no international standard. But as we go on, these will develop. But for this moment right now, it's a proprietary methodology. So therefore, there are different rating agencies that give different ratings to company. It really is sort of a brand label for people to associate with what they are doing being meaningful uh, of impact to society. So therefore, in that sense, you know, rating is important. We actually looked with Metropolitan University in a research over 2,000 something samples, and we identified uh, eight different companies with uh, similar rating agencies rating outcome. And what happened is uh, we find that there's no consistency. So a criticism is that ratings are not consistent, but that misses the point that there is actually no universal or unified standard, and therefore it is actually understandable. It is proprietary in nature, and it is basically better than nothing uh, right now at this stage, but also, because it actually goes through a process of analyzing the disclosure of uh, companies or players in the marketplace. Uh, therefore, rating agency do provide a certain level of comfort. Is it perfect? No, not yet. So that's why, you know, as an individual investor, it really depends on your profile. Uh, if your profile is that, you know, I really don't worry about what is the sort of equity that we're doing for this generation vis-a-vis -vis against the next generation, then rating may not actually be that important. Uh, if you actually just want to buy the thing that is uh, the best selling, the hot shot of the moment, it really doesn't matter. But if you are actually like 99% of the population, well, maybe 90% of the population, you're actually looking at something that is also meaningful, then it becomes important for you to actually look at the rating as well. But again, you know, uh, it is as you go on the journey, you find that, you know, you realize that certain rating agencies are more in tune with certain topics. And therefore, you might be following those eight ratings that you think are actually more aligned to what you think uh, is the correct position. So that really is uh, rating agencies in a nutshell. There is uh, criticism in the marketplace, but actually right now it's a facilitative tool. 
If you ask uh, companies what is it that they can do to get a better rating, it really is to be passionate about the topics that they really are passionate about to make sure that you know, they got a global brand in the marketplace and make sure that their disclosure, and this is fundamental because a lot of times the process of getting a rating is opaque. There's actually very little engagement with the rating agencies and hence you know, what you really need to do uh, is actually to make sure that your house is in order, make sure that you get good ratings. Looking ahead, we anticipate the establishment of widely accepted and consistent standards for ESG reporting. This development would simplify the reporting process and alleviate the burden on businesses caused by ever-changing requirements across different frameworks. Standardized reporting would also enable regulators, investors, lenders, and other stakeholders to effectively compare the sustainability performances of businesses operating within the same sectors. Now, let's hear from our guest speakers as they share their insights on this issue. The first one I would say is the convergence of international ESG frameworks. So over the past 20 years, the number of different sustainability reporting frameworks globally, some in Europe, some in US, etc. Now, the good news is finally, we are seeing the convergence of these frameworks, including the efforts driven by the ISSB, the International Sustainability Standards Board. And I think that by the time that they roll out their final reporting framework, it would be very exciting because over a hundred jurisdictions has already committed uh, in terms of reportings and aligning the reporting frameworks towards the ISSB framework. I think that's number one. The second one would be to do with ESG rating and data, because as we all know, you know, ESG is a new topic and a lot of professional organization or asset managers like us would be making use of ESG ratings and data. Now, last year, the IOSCO Association, meaning the Federations of International Financial Regulators, has actually came up with a consultation conclusion citing various challenges and limitations of these ESG data providers. So I believe that the next big thing that a lot of regulators would be working towards would be streamlining and also uplifting the bar of some of the you know, ESG data providers. And I think that is also a good change that we should be expecting. The future of um, ESG development will definitely keep sustainability practitioners quite busy. In fact, we're seeing um, an uptick in regulations. Um, so this means as an investment manager, we have to digest regulatory requirements on corporate disclosure to facilitate our understanding before we engage with individual companies and on different issues. And as an entity, as an investment manager, um, we're also facing different requirements to structure our um, investment philosophy and to report to clients accordingly. But Coming out of, of this, we think there will be a harmonized way of looking at ESG. There will be more consensus of um, what the best standards, best practices look like. So that's definitely a plus um, for ESG research. Um, so hopefully this will be um, easier, um, even though it will keep us busier um, in analyzing different ESG um, company performance. Typical investment tools include bonds, blue chip stocks, property, that is, bricks, and funds. The main focus for most people is usually on the risks and returns associated with these options. But many individual investors are not aware that their investment choices can have a significant impact on sustainability in the wider world. While central banks and private funds have incorporated ESG factors into their investment processes for both public and private market investments, the question remains, what can we as individuals do? There's no easy answer as to why, as an individual, I should be concerned about rating, but it is commonly assumed and commonly an increasingly valid proposition in the marketplace that if a company's got a good rating, it means it must be doing something good. And as an investor, 
it actually probably adds to the liquidity of the play. And therefore, you know, you don't want to be buying illiquid in the marketplace. You really want to be looking at things that have a sort of turn. And therefore, it is important as an investor, at least to be aware of this topic and actually to make differences in choices based maybe on this consideration, depending on your risk profile and your investment objectives. In general, I think everyone can uh, be part of the solution in sustainability. Hong Kong has always been a resilient and an efficient society. My hope is that we can apply the same spirit to run our businesses um, and make sure you know, we can achieve climate resilience um, and to improve our resource efficiency in our business operations. That's the essence of sustainable development. We should never underestimate the importance of what individual investors could do. Now, for asset managers, right, they are actually manage assets for their ultimate investors, right, which they owe their fiduciary duties. We call them asset owners. Individual investors actually give money to asset managers to manage. And as a result, you know, the preferences and values of individuals investors actually uh, shape with shape asset managers uh, role and also pays in terms of achieving all this sustainability integration. We all want our money not only to preserve our financial security, but also to contribute to improving our world. While traditional investment advisors focus on risk preferences, timelines, and return expectations, environmentally and socially conscious individuals should consider two additional questions. Are the companies we invest in engaged in harmful activities such as pollution, producing dangerous products, or mistreating people? And do the companies we invest in actively promote social and environmental well-being? Although we couldn't delve into specific investment options, such as green bonds, sustainability-linked bonds, engagement funds, or ESG funds in this episode, raising awareness about responsible and sustainable investing is a positive starting point. Thank you for watching.